My name is Alan Canfora. I was a junior here in 1970. I was 21 years old. Uh, when I first got out of high school in 1967, I was certainly not against the war in Vietnam. I didn't know anybody in my hometown that was against the war in Vietnam. Uh, I'm from a town about 13 miles to the southwest of here, just on the other side of the city of Akron. And uh, most of our friends that we had gone through school with, our neighbors, our relatives, they were going off to Vietnam, the young men. If they were healthy, you were going to Vietnam. And consequently, we supported them. And uh, most of us, I think, our parents, uh, at least uh, the majority, parents had been in the World War II. My mom and my dad were both uh, World War II veterans. My mother was in the Women's Army Corps, the WACs, as they were called. She was a nurse in the Women's Army Corps. She would take care of the soldiers who returned home from uh, the war in Europe, mostly. And sometimes their arms or their legs would be blown off or their face was blown off and she would have to put the cigarette in their mouth and light the cigarette as a nurse probably shouldn't do, but back then they didn't know the danger of cigarettes, but she would help these guys just to light their cigarettes because they had no arms, for example. Uh, my father, on the other hand, was in the Army and he was in the Philippine Islands. He suffered an injury to his eye when he was 19. It was an accident that really wasn't in the war. But consequently, he only had one eye for the rest of his life. He had to have a glass eye. But he was 19 and came from the Philippines. He went up to an army hospital in Michigan. And that's where he met my mom. She was the army nurse there. And as a result, here I am because of World War II, because of the military. So I was raised up not to be against the military. Uh, I think that's how it was for our whole generation. We had won World War II. I was born only uh, not quite four years after the end of World War II. So it was a big topic of discussion, and people were feeling still very proud, you know, that we had won in World War II. And our feeling was our government would never get involved in a war unless it was winnable and had the support of the American people. And we would get in there, and we would get out, and we would declare victory. And I think that's what we all thought was going to happen with Vietnam. As we got up to be uh, our teenage years, President Kennedy was killed in 1963, of course, and then the next year, President Johnson started sending more troops over there, and by 1965, they started coming home dead in our, our hometown. Ultimately, about a dozen were killed in Vietnam, but the first one was 1965, the last one was 1970. The last one, in 1970, was my very good friend from our childhood years. He was killed in Vietnam on April 13th, 1970. We found out the next day, April 14th, of course, this is only a few weeks before the tragedy here. Uh, I was a student living on uh, Summit Street, downtown Kent. One of our roommates was George Caldwell. He was an ex-Marine. His brother Bill, these guys were my childhood friends. Bill was in Vietnam, killed, age 19. Killed by an American tank while he was sleeping on the ground at night. It was such a hot, you know, oppressive area of the world. He was tired. These guys are sleeping. One of the officers says, let's have a practice run of the tanks, because he was in the tank corps. The tank started up, rolled over my friend, killed him. Hit him from the uh, neck down to the waist. He was killed at age 19. The next day, his brother George in our apartment got a phone call from the sister. The army was just here. Bill's dead in Vietnam, April 14th. Ten days later, the body finally got home. They had the funeral, April 24th, ten days before the shootings. We were all upset. George was our roommate, George and Bill were my childhood friends, but our other roommates were from Northeast Ohio, Cleveland, Akron, those areas. And uh, we all went to the funeral, and we were very upset. At that point, you could say for us, the war had come home. You see the coffin there, they had a closed coffin because of the nature of his uh, passing, and there was a big crowd there. He was a very popular young guy in Barberton, our hometown. The mother, father, the sisters, the brother George, the other brother Bob were there. And we were there with our long hair. We'd come in from Kent, which is only 13 miles, but uh, it was a little bit of a different world up here in Kent compared to Barberton at that time where uh, the funeral was held. And we were upset. We were mad. I mean, this was a situation where the war in Vietnam wasn't something just on TV that we were hearing about. This was real. This was a dead body in there. And we were at that graveyard, and we looked to each other, myself and my friends and my roommates. We were all anti-war. We were experienced protesters by that point. We said, <clears throat> at our next opportunity, 
we're going to send a message to President Nixon, stop this bloody war in Vietnam. We had no idea, April 24th, 1970, that six days later, President Nixon would invade Cambodia, would expand the war from Vietnam into another country next door, Cambodia. Well, that's what Nixon did. National TV comes out there, we thought he's just going to announce another troop withdrawal. We didn't think it was going to be an escalation, but that's what it was. And it was very shocking. As we watched our television set in uh, our apartment, we were cursing, we were upset. Here was Nixon only six days after we were at that funeral. He's saying, we're expanding the war. We're invading another country, Cambodia. We were very, very irate. And we knew that in the days ahead, and the next day would be May 1st, and then May 2nd, May 3rd, May 4th, culminated with the shootings. We had no idea that our actions in downtown Kent the next evening after that announcement would be somewhat of a catalyst that helped to uh, trigger the four days of protests which only culminated with the shooting incident. But that's uh, how we found ourselves uh, unknowingly in a situation where we would affect U.S. history and world history as well. And not in exactly a very peaceful or a, an ordinary way. That we would be involved with something entirely unique in the Vietnam War era. That we would trigger protests and we would join those protests for four days until only bullets would silence our voices against the war. So the next evening, uh, we went downtown Kent, and a lot of people were spreading rumors around that there were going to be these protests, there were going to be these actions. Basically, it was a spontaneous gathering of students in downtown Kent. People were clapping their hands, chanting anti-war slogans, writing uh, slogans on the wall against the war. And then one guy who was standing on the sidewalk down there in front of a bar took a beer bottle, and I've interviewed him for this book that I'm getting ready to publish my eyewitness account and the story of myself and our friends and what we did, and you're going to hear a little preview here today, a summation of my 500 pages. Uh, basically, he was holding a beer bottle, a cop car came by, and it was kind of an exciting atmosphere, and he threw this bottle of Stroh's beer. I always wondered if it was a Stroh's or a Rolling Rock, and he clarified when I interviewed him, it was a Stroh's. Uh, and that's really what triggered the four days of protests. Now, it's very ironic that that young man who took that action now supports President Trump. He's turned the other way, and uh, you know, the Vietnam War is over, and he's evolved, just like many from our generation are no longer you know, with the progressive or the left side. It's uh, kind of ironic that that has happened, but that's a little footnote in history. But that beer bottle jazzed up the crowd, it galvanized the crowd, the cops sped away, a little while later, another cop car came by, and this time about five or six people threw beer bottles, beer glasses, hitting the police car, and he sped away. The cops then stayed away. Students then moved into the street on North Water Street. It was a Friday night, downtown Kent, an unprecedented action. And within a few minutes, a few of us in the crowd said to everybody around, there were about maybe two or three hundred of us, on a signal, one, two, three, let's move down the street to the center of town which is where the bank windows were located. And so on the signal, the first time it didn't work, the second time everybody followed down the street, whooping and yelling. At that point, windows were broken primarily in a bank. 28 windows were broken in the bank, small windows, mostly like four foot by one foot, and 15 other windows were broken around town. Loan companies, uh, the army recruiter station, the gas company, the electric company, the telephone company, these windows were broken. And that really upped the ante, shall we say. It went from being a peaceful protest on a sidewalk, rowdy students, to beer bottles, beer glasses, occupying the street, moving down the street, breaking mostly bank windows, and the radicals then escaped back to our apartments. Mission accomplished. We had done something significant, trying to send a message to President Nixon, which is what we swore we would do at that funeral only one week earlier. So, that started the momentum that really dramatically increased the volatility that was here in Kent. And I'd like to point out, the same thing was happening all across the country on that night of May 1st, Friday night, 1970. I've read accounts where, for example, up at uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where there are many colleges, 
How many people here have ever been up there to Cambridge and Boston? You see college students everywhere. That's how it was then. Predominantly anti-war, especially on the East Coast. Those students marched from downtown Boston all the way to Cambridge, and that's where they started trashing out windows that night, too. And the same thing was happening around the country. I'm trying to point this out, not to say it's the right thing to do now. And I don't encourage you to do that now. But I would just like to say, for the sake of the accurate historical record, this is the kind of thing that was happening all around the country, not just in Kent, but in fact it did happen here. Some students, and very few, threw rocks, broke windows. The vast majority of the crowd didn't do that. Fourteen students were arrested that night down there, some stragglers. And that really did trigger the four days of activities. The mayor called down to Columbus, Ohio, where you passed through, I'm sure, on the highway. He said to the governor, we'd like to put the National Guard on alert. The situation is getting out of hand. So the National Guard was put on alert. Friday night, around midnight. Saturday morning, some students went down there to help clean up the glass. My sister went down there, my roommate. They brought back to our apartment a young straggler who was down there. It turned out to be the young girl, Mary Vecchio, who was in the famous picture screaming over Jeff Miller's dead body. I think you've all seen that uh, photo. And it turned out she was 14 years old, a runaway from Florida, who was just passing through town. But they brought her back, and we, she was hungry. We gave her some food, and she listened to music. And we thought, well, I don't know who this girl is, but she was uh, not exactly an intellectual, shall we say. 14 years old, it wasn't her fault, but she was hitchhiking around with her dog. And uh, so we knew we were going up to the campus that evening to uh, go to the protest that was spontaneously being organized by word of mouth against the ROTC on campus. Do you guys have ROTC down there at your school? Reserve Officer Training Corps? It's a good program. It was a good program back then. Enable working class kids or, or low income people to go into that program, sign the paper, you get free education for four years, then you go make a commitment to go into the military. Back then it was for two years. Not a bad deal. Bill Schroeder, of course, you probably heard in the film, you saw the film here, I think, he was a member of the ROTC. Now, he was against the war, and he had told his ROTC commander that when he got out of college, he was not going to Vietnam, he was going to go to uh, Canada. But the ROTC was the target that evening. As it turned out, 8 o'clock, people gathered outside the building on the commons, and you've toured out there, you know, it's a big open field. Cops were standing there by the ROTC building. Six cops standing around, smoking cigarettes. Those six cops in plain clothes, wearing their trench coats, that kept us away from the ROTC building. We were 300 of us in the middle of the field, so we said, let's just go march around the campus. So we did. We took off. We went up the hill past uh, Taylor Hall, which is this building, went down toward Tri Towers Dormitory. My roommate had the great idea because the university had organized some bands to play there with free pizza so they wouldn't come to the anti-war protest that evening. The university was clever. They had some good rock and roll bands and free pizza. And all these students were up on the second floor of Tri Towers Three dormitory complex. My roommate, we all marched down there, 300 of us, were chanting anti-war slogans, uh, out of the dorms, into the street, uh, anti-war stuff, uh, join us, join us. And here were all these students up in the uh, dorms, so my roommate pulled the fire alarm, just spontaneously, it wasn't planned, he just thought it was a good idea. Sure enough, all, the whole, all three dorms had to empty so that we go outside, and here's all these 300 anti-war protesters with maybe a thousand students from those three dorms, and we're shouting, join us, join us, and a lot of them joined us. We were kind of surprised. So our crowd grew, ultimately, after we left Tri Towers, we went down by Twin Towers and by Eastway Center, where there were about six more dorms. It turned out 2,000 students ended up in that crowd. So then we started marching back to the ROTC area with 2,000 students, and by then the sun had gone down. Uh, We've done that tactic a couple of other times down through the years here at Kent, and it works. If you're marching, I'm just giving you a little tactical advice here. Uh, if you're marching with just a few people and you go around to different dorms and stuff and you're chanting, and if it's your cause is just, people will flood out of the dorms and join you. And uh, that's what happened that night. So we come back to the ROTC area after the sun had gone down, and sure enough, the cops were gone. 
Maybe because some of us were in our crowd assuming that there were spies in our midst and we were shouting, on to the administration building, when in fact, not the administration building, but the ROTC building was our intended ultimate goal to march to. So we started yelling out onto the administration building, and sure enough, the cops were over there protecting the, RO, the administration building. So we stop at the ROTC building, and out of the crowd of 2,000, only a few, without mentioning any names, uh, went up to the building, started breaking out the windows of the ROTC building. And by the way, back then, ROTC was a target of protest around the country. In May of 1970, not only did that building burn that night, here on the campus, it burned down, 30 ROTC buildings were burned in May of 1970. So it wasn't just here. It was a target because it was a link between the college and the war in Vietnam. So it happened that night. First people broke out the windows. Then they were throwing railroad flares on the roof, which rolled off. One guy had a Molotov cocktail which was a bottle with gasoline in it, instead of throwing it perpendicularly at the building, which would have been the smart thing to do, he threw it at an angle, it bounced off the building, caught the ground on fire. Nothing was working, the books of matches, the railroad flare, the Molotov cocktail. Finally, some people saw a motorcycle, they went over and dipped their handkerchiefs into the motorcycle gas tank, took it back to the window, got the building going on fire a little bit. The firemen came with fire trucks, everybody ran away, Cop, the firemen put out the fire. The firemen were chased away by the student protesters. The hose was taken away, cut up with pocket knives. And so the firemen got back on their trucks. They went back downtown Kent. Again, the building was set back on fire. This time, it started going pretty good. The firemen came back a second time with police taking flash photographs. We all ran away. The building burned down to the ground. Has anybody heard any stories about that fire or any misconceptions? Or any questions about that fire? Okay. That was a turning point. That's when the ROTC building was on fire. The National Guard came rolling into Kent. 1,200 guardsmen came into Kent. 400 went into the city. 800 came onto the campus. It was like an armed camp. It looked like Germany or invading France in World War II. 1,200 guardsmen armed with M1 rifles, with tear gas launchers, with trucks, tank-like vehicles, they set up tents, they took over the football field, they took over the basketball gymnasium, they were everywhere. They occupied this campus, they occupied the city. So that was the situation, it became escalated. Some people think that the ROTC, the, the, uh, ROTC fire is what triggered the National Guard to arrive here, it's not true. The governor, as it turned out, had sent the ROTC at 5 o'clock or 5.30 5 that evening. It took about three or four hours for them to get here, but they were already on their way at around 5 or 6 o'clock at night. The National Guard was already coming to Kent. The fact that the ROTC fire occurred in that interim period is just a coincidence. The building did burn down. It was quite a fire. You could see the flames from 5 or 10 miles away. Uh, from the point of view of the anti-war protesters that tried to burn the building, there was a sense of satisfaction. That was a target of protest for two or three years previously. Faculty members were organizing protests at that building. Student radicals were organizing protests. The building was always protected by the cops. Nobody could get near it. The building was always protected. It never was attacked or burned. That night it burned down to the ground. So that really escalated the tension. The next day the governor comes here, Governor James Rhodes. Reminiscent of uh, Governor Rhodes, President Trump, I'm going to show my bias here. I'm going to confess to you, I am the chairperson of the Barberton Democratic Party, my hometown. I have been the chairperson of the Barberton Democratic Party since 1992. 26 years I have been biased against Republicans as the elected chairperson of the Democratic Party in my hometown. So I am biased. I'm going to get that right out there now. President Trump, facing an election, the days ahead, is using the same kind of rhetoric to attempt to sway his base. Trump's base are the conservative Republicans. He's inflaming the situation by using exaggerated rhetoric. And I say this because I want to emphasize to you, it's a dangerous situation today, just like it was a dangerous situation back then when our governor came to the campus the morning after the ROTC fire, running in an election on Tuesday, May the 5th, he came here on Sunday, May the 3rd, two days before his election. He was behind by 8% in the public opinion polls. Any politician who's behind by 8% with two days to go till their election is 
by definition, a desperate politician. Trump is facing a tough situation now. He's using harsh, exaggerated rhetoric. And that's what they do. They exaggerate the situation. The governor, in his own exaggeration, on May 3rd, 1970, the day before the shootings, two days before his election, the governor totally exaggerated the situation here, threw fuel on the fire. Governor James Rhodes said, the student protesters at Kent State University, and he said this about 24 hours before the shooting incident, he said the students here were the worst type of people we harbor in America, worse than the communists, worse than the brown shirts, he says, we're not going to be dealing with the symptoms. We're going to eradicate the problem. The next day, four students were eradicated. The, the rhetoric, the words that he used, inspired or kind of gave the green light, many of us have always said, many historians agree, gave the green light to the National Guard then to shoot into a crowd of people that were the worst type of people in America, worse than the communists, worse than the brown shirts, the worst type of people in America. And that's the kind of language Trump's using now. Demonizing Democrats, inspiring his people to send pipe bombs, to uh, making statements that many people are feeling inspires anti-Semitism. People just got shot in the synagogue. Some other people who are black just got shot in a uh, supermarket. This is the consequence of rhetoric. Words have consequences. I'm just saying this to draw a parallel because honestly, I fear another Kent State could happen today because of the polarization, the divisions, the hatred, citizen against citizen. The National Guard who heard Governor Rhodes' speech were American citizens, citizens of this county, Portage County. They heard that rhetoric and they thought, oh, these long-haired hippies, these radical students, they're the worst type of people. And they were feeling this generation gap, this gap between the long hairs and the conservatives, the pro-war against the anti-war. It was a formula for a disaster when the governor and his rhetoric created that kind of a circumstance and inspired what turned out to be a massacre. So the governor gave that speech and it almost worked because he was behind by 8%. Two days later, he only lost by less than one half of 1%. The closest statewide governor election ever in the history of Ohio. Uh, because as soon as the shooting happened, they blamed the victims. They said the students were shooting at the guard, there was a sniper, all these rocks and bottles were being thrown, the guard were threatened, the students were five feet away, the guard said. Turned out the closest student was 72 feet away. No student fired a gun and no rocks and bottles were being thrown at the time of the shootings. In fact, on the day of the shootings, only one guardsman was treated for a rock thrown injury. That happened 15 minutes before the massacre. So at the time of the shootings, there was nothing being thrown. But they told those lies, and Governor Rhodes created that atmosphere. They started the cover-up. So that's why I think the governor almost pulled off his plan. But to get to May 4th, uh, and even that evening, May 3rd, the night after, the night, a few hours after the governor's speech, several students were stabbed and cut by bayonets of the National Guard. A young woman was backed against the library. She came out of the library into a scene of chaos when the guard attacked a peaceful gathering of students, chased them onto the campus. This girl was standing, young woman was standing back against the library wall. The guardsman came up, stabbed her in the abdomen. The bayonet, it's like a long knife on the end of a rifle. The bayonet came out her side in the back. So she was pierced by a bayonet. Another student had his arm slashed. Another guy stabbed in the leg. About six students, male and female, were stabbed, cut, slashed by bayonets the night before the shootings. So all of these activities set the stage for May 4th. Windows broken downtown, the ROTC fire, the stabbings of the students, the governor's speech, all set the stage for May 4th. Monday, May 4th, we show up there at the Commons, 12 o'clock noon. The same group of long-haired students that were basically the ones that gathered downtown at the ROTC building. But this time, our group of about 300 anti-war students were joined by maybe another 1,500 bystanders because it was a great dramatic scenario. You see this building here on top of a hill. You got the commons down there, you got the guard across the field. It was really, I think, uh, a scenario like a, a Shakespearean tragedy about to unfold. We didn't know it then, but that's what the situation was. 12 o'clock noon, the guard ordered us to leave. A jeep came out, we stood our ground. We thought, this is our campus, classes are in session. Martial law was not declared until the next day after the shootings. So we thought we had a right to express ourselves on our own campus. Instead, the National Guard then started firing tear gas. They marched out toward us. 
76 guardsmen in a long line came marching toward us, shooting the tear gas. It was difficult to breathe, difficult to see, so we all started running away. We didn't want to confront the guard because we knew they had stabbed people the night before. Uh, so we ran away, up over Taylor Hill. Other people came up around the other side. The whole crowd of about 1,500 or 1,800 people, students, ran away entirely, and the National Guard had achieved their goal. We were by the Victory Bell. They fired the tear gas. They chased us. We ran away over the hill. A big mystery. Why did they follow us over the hill? I've said, after careful, careful consideration and studying the evidence and being an eyewitness, I'm convinced that the Guard knew that what they wanted to do was chase us, identify who are the people waving the black protest flags. I waved a black protest flag. Who are the people throwing the rocks? Allison Krauss threw rocks. Dean Kaler, who shot in the back and paralyzed for life, threw a couple rocks. Jeffrey Miller, my friend, shot in the face, lying there in the big, uh, with a pool of blood with Mary Vecchio. Jeffrey threw a few rocks. Uh, Joe Lewis, who was shot in the abdomen and in the, and in the uh, ankle, he was giving obscene gestures, the finger. I think the National Guard, during that 24 minutes, they marched out, they fired the tear gas, they chased us over a hill, they went down the other side, some of them got down and started aiming. That's when that long-haired kid came forward with his black flag, you may have seen the photo. That was me. I don't think I did anything to deserve to be shot. I was 150 feet away at the time that they were aiming, they didn't shoot. Instead, they marched up the hill, 76 men in a formation, and as they go up the hill, we're watching from the behind, only on the far right flank, and you've been out there, you probably can imagine this, 76 men, only the far right flank, about a dozen guys get to the hilltop, they get the order to fire right here, point, fire. It's on a tape, we have the tape, it's been analyzed, been verified by experts. Out of the 76 men, that dozen on the right end stopped, turned, raised their weapons, began to fire and continue to fire for 12.53 seconds. I don't think it's a coincidence, and I don't know how mathematically it could be probable for a dozen men to simultaneously stop, simultaneously turn, raise their weapons, begin to shoot, and continue to shoot for 13 seconds without an order to fire. Those of us who were there that day who saw that, we knew there was an order. Students heard the verbal command to fire. Guardsmen, five of them in their own handwriting, on May 4th, five of the guardsmen said, they heard an order to fire. So there was an order to fire. And what did they do? They shot 67 gunshots into the ground. Joe Lewis, the closest student, standing there 72 feet away, shot through the abdomen, shot through the ankle. He fell down by some miracle he lived. 90 feet away, John Cleary, taking photographs, turned to get away. The bullet went in and out of his chest. He fell down. Somehow he survived too. Down at the bottom of the hill, myself and my roommate, 225 feet away, 75 yards away. I get behind a tree, bullet goes in through the front of my wrist here, exited out through the side. In, out. The bullet went through my arm. A right. Uh, out of the, 11, uh, out of the uh, 13 victims, 11 of us, the bullets pierced through us, of course. Uh, the M1 rifles that they fired can fire for a distance of two miles. Their bullets can pierce through steel. Very deadly weapons. And 11 of us had the bullets go through us. Allison Krauss had some, some of the uh, pellets, or some of the uh, bullet fragments still inside of her. The bullet went through her left arm into her chest. The bullet fragmented. Some of those fragments stayed in her. And Robbie Stamps, who was shot in the hip, uh, part of the bullet stayed very close to his spine. He was almost paralyzed. But for the rest of us, penetrated, pierced by the bullets. So down near the bottom of the hill, I'm shot through my wrist. I stay behind the tree. I got shot within the first second. I was a target, waving that black flag. My roommate, Tom Grace, is out in the open. He was running away. The bullet went in through the top of his ankle, blew out the bottom of his foot, blew his boot right off of his foot. So I'm behind the tree. Bullets are flying for 13 seconds. I'm, Tom Grace and I are hitting the first second. And he's out there in the open, right in the wide open, and he's yelling and screaming in pain. And I, I'm thinking, well, we got shot by buckshot. The bullet went in my wrist. I, I didn't even see that I had the exit wound until I got to the hospital. I had a Levi jacket on, and I saw this, this wound here. I thought, well, I've been hit by buckshot, like a pellet. So the fact is, we're out in the open. The bullets are flying this way. They go behind us into the parking lot. 
hundreds of feet from where the shooters were standing, that's where all four students were killed in the distant parking lot. So the guard fired down the hill. They wounded four on the hillside. There were only 18 of us on the hillside, according to photographic analysis of the, of the evidence, of the photos. 18 students, four of us were wounded on the hillside. The vast majority of the shots were fired way out behind us in the distant parking lot. Four students killed there, four more wounded there. So they fired down the hillside, four wounded on the hillside, four dead in the parking lot, four more wounded in the parking lot, so they hit eight in the parking lot. Uh, Jim Russell was off at a 90 degree angle, hit by a shotgun blast by a National Guardsman, hit in the forehead and in the thigh with some pellets. He survived. So the vast majority of the shots came right down our way, and most of them into the parking lot. And why would they fire into the parking lot? I think it's an interesting question. You might wonder, you've been out there. The fact of the matter is, uh, that's where the most radical students were gathered. When the guardsmen marched across the hill, across the commons, chased us over the hill, they went down to the practice field, they noticed the radical students had congregated in that parking lot. And that's why they fired the vast majority of their shots there. It's where Jeffrey Miller was killed, 265 feet away, bullet in through his, through his cheek right here. I saw him at the hospital, uh, he was lying in the back of an ambulance. I didn't know he was dead, but he was my friend. I saw the big hole in his face, I didn't know the bullet had passed through his head. Allison Crouch trying to get behind a car, 343 feet away. The bullet goes through her arm, into her chest, and it fragmented, went into her liver, her lung, her spleen, and uh, she bled to death pretty quickly. Further out in the parking lot, Bill Schroeder, all-American boy, member of the ROTC. The guardsman had marched away, it looked like the whole thing was over. He said to his roommate, see you later, Lou, I'm going to my class. Walking with his books, the bullet hit him in his shoulder blade, came out through the front of his chest. He was lying there in the parking lot talking to the students that were trying to save his life. He was still alive at the hospital, talking to the doctors, but he died there at the hospital. Uh, people say that if he'd been shot nowadays, it's not a fatal wound. The bullet went through, it just hit part of his lung, they probably could have saved him. Back then he was the only one that made it to the hospital, but he passed away. The, the last one was Sandy Scheuer. Sandy, a member of the Alpha Z Delta sorority. Mother and father were Jewish. Uh, they escaped, her father escaped Nazi Germany. He had the tattoo on his arm. He was a uh, uh, prisoner of the Nazis for a while until he escaped. Came to the United States to escape Nazism and his daughter is killed on a college campus on his wedding anniversary. Uh, Martin and Sarah Scheuer were married on May 4th, I think around 1948 or 49, and uh, that was their wedding anniversary, May 4th, and their daughter was killed here. She was walking to her class with her friend, she was not a protester, books under her arm, and her friend called out her name. She was 390 feet away, and Sandy turned to look back, and the bullet came flying, hit her right in the throat, went through her vocal cords, her larynx. It's ironic because she was a speech therapy major. She had studied the voice box, and that's where the bullet went through. Uh, you can see that she had uh, entrance and exit wounds in her throat. She was killed pretty quickly. So that was the situation. Four more were wounded in the parking lot. Jim Russell, I mean, uh, Doug Renmore shot through the knee. Scott McKenzie shot through the neck. The bullet came out of his face. He lived. Uh, these were some Robbie Stamps shot in the hip. Yeah, so these were some significant gunshot wounds, and really, I'm one of the lucky ones that lived to tell the story. I, sp I have spoken out down through the years. I've been outspoken. Mainly, what compels me to do this is Jeffrey Miller was my friend. He was silenced forever on that day, killed instantly. He can't cry out from the grave for truth or for justice. So I have tried, along with many other people, including the students on this campus down through the years, to be the voice of Jeffrey Miller, Allison Krauss, Sandy Scheuer, Bill Schroeder. I think we've achieved much of our goal down through the years, but the goal has not really been fully attained until the government admits the wrongfulness of what happened here. Uh, the 20th, 2020 is going to be the 50th anniversary. Some of us are going to be making appeals to the different gov governments without getting specific about our plans. And we're hoping that by the 50th anniversary, we can attain a significant version of justice for the victims that were killed here in Kent State. Thank you for your attention. Anybody have any questions? Uh, 
<clears throat> what do you do you think like full justice is possible and what would that look like to you well you know what that, that's a concept we've discussed down through the years some people are so bitter they think that the only true justice would be to have these killers arrested and put in jail uh, when i was younger i was still radicalized and still angry i was an angry young man i didn't even register to vote till i was 30 1979, I was alienated from the system, but I have come to see that the system works if we make it work. And so I see the importance of compromise, uh, the importance of what the American soldiers have done with their enemies in Vietnam. They go to Vietnam now, they break bread with their former Viet Cong enemies, they go out to the battlefield, they talk about the lessons, and they've healed their wounds. I think that's what we need to do here at Kent State. So I'm, I'm willing to, I've, I've met with a couple of the guardsmen, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Fassinger and uh, Captain James Ronald Snyder, I've met with them. And they're always surprised I'm so agreeable to speak with them in a friendly way or a constructive way. And I think that's what we need to do between now and the 50th, and some of us are going to be doing more of that, so that justice for us will be just having those guys finally admit what is the real story, you know, who gave the order. Who gave you the live ammunition? Who ordered you to kneel down on the practice field and aim your guns? These are things the commanders all have denied and continue to deny to this day. Clearly, among those commanding officers, and just about all of them are gone now, I think somebody from the lower ranks, among the shooters, will come forward and reveal the truth. I think if we attain the truth, I think that will also bring simultaneously a sense of justice. So that's what we're hoping for. Although there are still some people who are very bitter, they want those guys arrested. I don't think you could charge them with anything at this late date. The only crime that I think has no statute of limitations is uh, murder. And you would never be able to get that kind of a charge, nor should we at this late date. Um, 50 years later, what advice would you give to modern student activists? My advice is, and just yesterday I was invited to speak to some student activists in Illinois. I can't go because it's a short notice, but I still consider myself to be a student organizer. Uh, I helped to organize the May 4th Task Force Student Group here in 1975. I attended meetings all the way until 2015 when my daughter was born, my first child, my only child, born in 2015. She's three, Maya. Uh, and uh, so I, I kind of have taken a break from student organizing, but. I talk to student activists, I advise them to channel the enthusiasm that they feel as young people and the idealism. Channel it in a positive way so that you can affect political power. It's not good enough just to have ideas about lofty goals, whatever they might be philosophically from a socialist or left-wing uh, persuasion. Ideas are fine, but unless you can affect political power, it's strictly like an intellectual exercise. It's like a debating society. I'm not into that, and I don't encourage young people to be into that. It's fine to have your ideas, but channel your energy into affecting the people that are causing the problems. Like these young people out of Parkland, Florida, they're such an inspiration to me, that David Hawk and Emma Gonzalez and people like that, they know the importance of voting and targeting who are the people responsible for the problems that are happening. And so that's what I think is important, participating within the system to gain political power and to deny power to the bad people. Um, uh, so how, what was the campus like after the shooting? And also, I know there was a large controversy in 1977 with the, uh, with the building of the gym annex. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I can. That's a very astute uh, uh, questions you have there. That's very impressive that you are aware of the gym protests, which mm -hmm. I got arrested four times that summer. My sister was arrested seven. My sister was the Jane Fonda of our movement, we always used to say. But uh, the first part of your question was about what happened to the campus. The campus was evacuated on May 4th in the hours after the shootings. By five o'clock, the entire campus was evacuated. People had to go home. People had to just grab a suitcase, get out of your dorm. The university provided buses to go to Cleveland, to Akron, to Canton, to Youngstown to Pittsburgh, and this campus was evacuated. Couldn't come back until mid-June when the summer session uh, started. So we were on quarters then 
you know, now we're on semesters here, but uh, back then we were going to be going to school till like June the 6th or June the 10th or something. But here was May 4th. That was the end. We had to finish our courses by correspondence. The professors would send us a letter, okay, here you have an open book assignment, you know, uh, do a book report or something simple. Uh, I got all A's except for I got one B in bowling because <laughs> I had to bowl. I couldn't bowl, my, my arm was bandaged. And I wrote the letter, I explained my situation to my bowling teacher, and she gave me a B anyway. I thought that was very unfair. Otherwise, I would have had a four point for my only time in my college career. I got a 3.91, which I was, I was happy with that, but we had to finish through the mail. So it was easy, everybody got good grades, but they, they had the graduation ceremony. They did have the graduation on a certain day in June. Uh, but it was really like a very eerie situation where nobody was allowed here on this campus. Uh, the National Guard stayed around for four more days. They were shooting on, the shooting was on May 4th, Monday. They stayed till Friday the 8th. So the campus was still fully occupied by Guard troops and the city. And there were 400 guardsmen in the city on, on all the major street corners. Uh, there was like a big shopping plaza out there on the South Water Street. They had their troops, their, their uh, trucks out there, tents out there on the concrete parking lot. Uh, so it was really like an armed camp. But the school was evacuated. But then the tension really started again in the summer. Here comes the students back. There was a question, are there going to be big demonstrations, calling for justice, protesting the guard? It was a calm summer. Going into the fall, that's when the protests started right back up. And continued into the spring of 1971, when local sheriffs confronted protesting students downtown again on Water Street, shot tear gas and rubber bullets and wooden pellets, they called them knee knockers. My buddy got shot in the back with one, he had a knot like a, like a big as a baseball coming out of his shoulder blade. I guess it could have killed you if it shot you in the temple or the eye or something, but they shot people again, but this time with non-lethal weapons. That happened in 71 and 72. So there were continuing protests. Now, that continued. The university, to their credit, sponsored commemoration programs on May 4th, 1971, 72, 73, 74, 75. After five years, though, the university made a big announcement. No more commemorations. Five years is long enough. We're not going to have any more remembrance of that tragic day. It was a dark day. Let's forget about it. That made the student government mad here. And they formed a group called the May 4th Task Force. I was in graduate school. Uh, first of all, I was banned from Kent from the fall of 70. I was arrested. I was put on probation for a terrible crime, I have to confess. I possessed marijuana. <laughs> terrible crime. I was banned. I couldn't come onto the campus from the fall of 70 until the fall of 73. And so in 74, I came back to graduate school. I got my master's degree, and now I'm a librarian in Akron, Ohio, and the library director of the Akron Law Library, top floor of the Summit County Courthouse. I'm the director. Uh, but I did come back to school here to mainly cause trouble and uh, you know, organize. And uh, I remember my first step when I came back on the campus I thought to myself, have mercy on this university for letting me come back in. <laughs> and sure enough, uh, I joined the May 4th Task Force. I started organizing students. In 1977, to get to your question, we started doing stuff in the fall of 75 with the May 4th Task Force. By 1977, the university announced, we're going to build a big gymnasium out here on part of the May 4th shooting site. Oh, big mistake by Kent State. Big, mis big mistake stopping the commemorations, first of all after 75, because then the students started doing it, took it away, and they do that still to today, after all these years. So that was their first mistake. Then secondly, trying to build that gym, we warned them. We said, look, you can build, there were so many open spaces. Don't build that gym annex right there. Well, they're, they're gonna do it. So it turned out to be over 300 people got arrested. My mom and dad got arrested. Uh, the mother and father of Sandy Scheuer, who was shot through the throat, the sorority uh, woman. Her mom and dad got arrested, the guy who had the tattoo, he went to jail. Uh, Sandy's mom and dad and my mom and dad went to jail together. They got released the same day, it was civil disobedience, but there, was, there were 194 people arrested in one day. And then there were other incidents. But they still built the gym. You can see it's out there. It's a monstrosity, it's an obscenity. To this day, it's a blot on the, on the uh, May 4th issue. And I do believe at some point it's going to come down because the building's not really being used for what it was intended to be. It's got a big crack in the foundation. So I think that building will come down at some point. But it is a blot. It, it's, 
It's a monstrosity. You raise a really interesting point about the role of rhetoric and how yes. it can empower things in these situations. Um, I want to ask you what you think the role of social media might have played had that existed in, in your time, and then your thoughts on how it plays a role in today's protest. That is a very good question. Um, I really envy your generation. Uh, back then, just to make a protest flyer, like saying that we're going to have a meeting tonight at 7 o'clock, it would take like an hour or two just to make the flyer. You had to use this stencil paper. You, know, you had to use these press-type letters. I mean, just, to, just to print up sometimes one word would take 15 minutes, like pressing these letters. It was such a hassle. Uh, and then difficult. Then you had to go out there and actually pass out the flyer on the, you know, in the commons or at the student union. And nowadays, you guys got, man, you got email, you got all these websites and Facebook. I mean, it's such a perfect opportunity to do organizing. And sure enough, your generation is doing that. I mean, it's just fantastic. Uh, and if there was social media back then, all the lies about Vietnam wouldn't have been able to be perpetrated for so many years. I say, and I've always said, the reason I got radicalized against the war in Vietnam was because my friends were coming home from Vietnam telling me the real stories, what they, what they went through. And they were all saying the same thing. Don't go. Poor leadership. Losing strategy. Unwinnable war. Horrible living conditions. Filth. Uh, the soldiers getting killed all the time by accidents. You know, bombs coming in the wrong place, blowing up 10 guys, that kind of stuff. So they were all telling us across the country, don't go, this war is horrible. That's really how the anti-war movement exploded. The troops coming home were like a Trojan horse. The, the government was doing everything they could to hide the truth, but those troops are coming home telling the real story. And nowadays with social media, I mean, these people are coming home, they're, they're writing from their blogs over there in Afghanistan or whatever, you, you get the real story of what's going on. So it's, it's a much better situation now, much better. Uh, social media has its ups and its downs, its good and its bad points, but I think overall it has a democratizing effect. I think it's very good. How was your grieving process affected with this being such a high profile event in the national spotlight? It was tough. Uh, I remember, it wasn't so bad for me, I was a tough guy, you know, macho guy, leaving black flag, you know, <laughs> aiming guns at me. I didn't care. I was bad, you know. I was a macho, working class guy. Hung on the pool hall while my teenage years wasted my time. But uh, after the shooting, it was rough for everybody who witnessed it. Uh, it was traumatic. Uh, anytime any of us heard a car backfire or a firecracker or something, you jumped. I mean, for a couple of years, it was, it was a difficult situation. Where many people say that. Man. My girlfriend in particular was affected. Uh, it ultimately led to our breakup four years later because I was political and I was going to go back to the campus and I'm going to you know, fight for truth and justice and stuff. And she, anytime Tom Grace, my roommate, would call me, what are we going to do? Or somebody in my hometown, I mean, she would just start crying. She would get all upset. She knew Jeff Miller. She introduced me to Jeff Miller a few months before the shooting. She lived down Tri Towers. She knew Allison Crops real well, down Tri Towers. Uh, my sister knew Sandy Scheuer. People, now those, those four students were very popular. Uh, they were beloved. And uh, so it was difficult. Uh, but at the same time, time heals all wounds. Uh, that evening after the shootings, I remember we were back in Barberton, my mom and dad's house. We camped out in the backyard and uh, we were talking about what happened. It was just, a, it was a surreal situation. It was unbelievable to be shot down on a you know, college campus, broad daylight. And then to hear the news, well, the generals, are, they're blaming the victims. They were shooting at us. We're hearing the news story. They're, students were shooting at the National Guard. Students were five feet away about to take the guns away. We knew the closest students 72 feet away. So that was the tough part, really. It was really, I think, the most difficult thing was seeing the cover-up by the government. That was really the toughest. To me, it was tougher than losing our fellow students. I mean, you, you lose the fellow students. That was the kind of thing that was happening to black people, for one thing, back then, all the time. It finally happened to us. But uh, it was tougher to see the government cover it up. Um, one, of the, like, one of the things I didn't really realize, it's been, I've been enlightened about all here, is the disappearance of the bus group once, yeah. um, once the you all decided to burn down the ROTC building. Do you, what do you think like changed, do you, what, do you think there's like a naivete with 
like what the cops could do to you? The white students? Yes, yes absolutely. Uh, I think we had some degree of white privilege. You know, we thought, it's our campus, we might have long hair, we might be yelling, cussing, throwing stuff. They're not going to shoot us. Mm -hmm. And especially, people like me and others, I mean, Tom Grace, my roommate, ended up writing a history book about 1970, which is a very good history book. It could be better, but, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I mean, after all, it's a history book. That's a problem. But uh, he says, uh, he talks a lot about bus. And uh, black United students back then, they were militant. I was in the SDS, fall of 68. When I first got here on this campus, I joined the College Democrats, and I thought they were kind of lame. So a month later, Tom Grace and I joined the SDS, and they were militant, and they were radical. And then as soon as we joined the SDS, here's these black students protesting against these racist police. Uh, the Oakland Police Department from Oakland, California, came all the way to Canton, Ohio, trying to recruit cops, because they were so controversial for shooting black people in Oakland, California, you know, right by San Francisco. They couldn't even recruit people in California. So they're coming to Ohio. We thought, hey, man, we're going to go out there and let these guys know. You're not welcome here. But the bus students were there. And they were in there protesting in that building, took over the building. SDS, we go in there, the white radicals. And uh, we're there with them. University ends up arresting a bunch of the leaders. Then bus marched off campus. You probably heard about that. Like out of uh, 500 black United students, 99% of them walked off campus with their suitcases. That was really national news. You know, Kent State University, almost all the black students march off campus because of racism. And the university gave in a couple days later, dropped all the charges, and we won a big victory. The SDS and the black, you know, we were together. By the time 1970 came around, black United students were still tough guys, you know, militant. But the SDS was gone. Our leaders were all put in jail in the spring of 69. But some of us, Tom Grace, myself, and some others were still here. And, uh, but the Black United Students got warned. Some black students came up here on Friday, May 1st, a rally on the front campus, and there were about 400 black students out there on the field. And the black students from Ohio State University said, if there's protests here this weekend, black students don't go. Because when they started shooting down at Ohio State the week before, they were aiming at the black students. So that's why the black students did not show up on Friday night downtown, Saturday night at the ROTC incident, Sunday, May 3rd. May 4th, there were a couple of black students out there, according to the photos and eyewitnesses. Very few. So they were warned. I think they knew the seriousness of the situation. Anytime in a black community you saw armed, you know, government, law enforcement showing up, they knew that they might be a target. So they were more aware that we were. We were like I was saying, I was a militant student, and Tom Grace in his book said I was the most experienced anti-war protester out there on May 4th. Maybe true. Because I'd been in the SDS in 68, 69, we went down to Washington, we were doing a lot of stuff. My experience said, back then, if you keep your distance, the cop can't grab you, he can't beat you with the club, he can't arrest you. So I thought, as long as I stay far enough away from those National Guard, I'm going to be okay. So 150 feet when I was waving that black flag, that's the closest I got to them that day. When I got shot, I was 225 feet away. I thought I was safe. So we were naive. And I think it was an eye-opening experience for our whole generation. You could become a target, whether you're white or black. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. When the bullets started flying, um, what was, what, like, what was going through your head at that moment? And then, um, I guess, also, like, why did you hide behind the that's a good question. Um, I remember it quite well. Uh, it's etched, I think, into all of our memories, those of us who saw the incident happen. Uh, it just seemed like a nightmare situation because it was so sudden. It wasn't like they gave us a warning or like when they were on the practice field, they were kneeling, they were aiming. It gave us time to think like, oh, what's happening here? Uh, are they going to shoot? You know, that kind of stuff. Like on the practice field, I thought, are they going to shoot? I'm standing there waving the flag. I'm protesting. All of a sudden, they get down on their knees and they aim. They start aiming at me and others around me. And so I had, I had to think, like, wow, they're kneeling. They're aiming 150 feet away. And I thought, well, they're not going to shoot 150 feet away. I'm just not throwing anything. I'm not walking toward them. I thought, they're not going to shoot. They did. When they got to the hilltop, as they, as they marched away from that scenario, they got to the hilltop. All of a sudden, they stopped, turned, started shooting. It was a different situation where you had to think then at that moment, wow, what is going on? First thing everybody thought, 
and I've read through all the eyewitness accounts, I've sat through all the courtroom testimony. We had a trial in 1975 that lasted 13 weeks. All the guardsmen on the witness stand, the students, eyewitnesses, photographers, I heard all the testimony. I've read all the statements to the FBI, to the Highway Patrol, to national, to the grand jury, the state grand jury, the federal grand jury, so many eyewitness testimonies. Everybody thought they were shooting blanks. It's like, all of a sudden they stop and turn and start shooting them. What? Why are they, there's no reason to shoot the closest students 72 feet away. They were going up the hill, it looked like they were marching away. They agreed. When they first attacked us, they came across the commons up over the hill, down to the practice field. They were going back up the same route exactly. It looked like a retreat. It looked like everything was over. And that's what's really tragic, in my opinion. If they'd only continued walking a few more steps and gone over that hill back down where they came from, that would, that would have been the end of everything. We would have all just gone back to our dorms, our apartments, gone to class. And we'd always remember 1970 as, oh, that was the year of that riot in downtown Kent, the mysterious ROTC fire, because until to, today we really don't know who burned the building. Students tried, some people, including me, think it was a failure, and that the building was actually burned after we were chased away. Or we'd always remember, oh, the governor came and he gave that speech, and that's how we'd remember 1970. But no, they got to that hilltop, they stopped, they turned, they started shooting. 67 shots. So it was like a shocking moment. I thought, they've got to be shooting blanks, but then I saw that tree. I, was, I started running away from them. I talk about this in my book, that moment. I started zigging and zagging. I thought, if these are real bullets, I'm not just going to run in a straight line. I figured they're going to be aiming at me because I was really harassing them, cussing at them and stuff. So I thought, I'm going to zig and I'm going to zag. I was always very agile. I'm still kind of agile. I gained a little weight, but uh, <laughs> I was always an athlete as a kid. So I, I kind of like zigged and I zagged. I zigged and I zagged and I saw the tree. Boom, I jumped right behind. Got behind the tree. Wham, hit. So that was my sequence. Like a few zigs and zags. And I saw the tree. I thought, well, just in case these are real bullets, I'm going to get behind that tree. Bam. As soon as I got shot, I thought, damn, it's like a nightmare. I, got, I thought to myself, I can't believe it. I have been shot. There's like a moment of disbelief. I think that's probably how everybody feels when something quick happens, like a car wreck. Or, uh, you know, there's that moment of disbelief. Then I thought, they're still shooting. There's all these bullets. Like You could just hear the bullets zipping through the air, both sides of the tree, going behind me into that parking lot where nobody got killed. And you could hear, the, I thought I heard bullets hit the tree. I could hear bolts ripping through the grass, both sides of the tree. And so there, Tom Grace and I, we're right in the middle of the line of fire at the bottom of the hill. Most of the bullets going back there. So there's just a lot of them zipping, cracking through the air. One time, a few years later, we were way out in the country, me, my girlfriend, and different people, and the hippies, you know, long hair, and hiking in the country. And these redneck guys were clear across this reservoir, and they fired some shots near us. They were just goofing on us, you know, trying to scare us or something. Again, we could hear the sound of those bullets. Like a bullet, if it's coming near you, you hear it make like a zipping sound. And that's when we heard that for 13 seconds. So I, mean, I got shot in the first second, and for the next 12 seconds, you just heard it all. I just knew I had to stay behind that tree. That tree back then was like this wide. There, there's a photograph taken from the side. One, one student is standing up like this to make himself thin you know, behind the tree. And I'm kneeling behind, I'm looking at my wrist, and, so I'm just there bleeding, you know, for 12 seconds. I'm yelling out at Tom Grace, and then the shooting stopped. And there was a moment of silence, just quiet. And then you start hearing screaming. So I saw a hand back there someplace. There you go. Um, so how did it affect your parents' worldview after you? My parents were already cool about it. You know, by 1970, my mom and dad were World War II veterans, as I said. They were for the war. But by 1970, you know, there were so many of our, like my cousin got shot in the knee. Uh, my other cousin, you know, two of my other cousins were in Vietnam. They got all traumatized. Uh, one of my best friends from my grade school came back a heroin addict and with malaria and hepatitis. I mean, there were just, in fact, he was with us there on May 4th. Uh, he came back in December of 69, weighed like 110 pounds, he had malaria and hepatitis. And he started, he'd come up to camp with me, and that was it. My roommate's a lovely guy. He was like a cool guy from Barbara. He was a working class guy, but Vietnam veteran. He started living on our, at our apartment with the other guy, George, who was the Marine. They were both veterans, so he was crashing on our floor. We had five guys plus those two veterans in our living room every night. Let me just tell you about my mom now. By 1970, because of all of our friends coming home from Vietnam, talking, 
to my mom and dad. My cousins are telling my mom and dad at the Christmas party, geez, that Vietnam is horrible. So my mom and dad finally realized that my sister and I were right. My sister and I used to really raise a fuss at the Italian spaghetti dinners. Let me tell you, we'd make a weird long hair. We'd be arguing with my mom and dad. And finally, they realized by 1970, so after I got shot, my mom and dad go to the hospital. I was already gone. I, I said to the doctor, I'm leaving. So I left, came back to my apartment with my wrist bandage. And my mom and dad finally come in the door and they just asked us what happened. We told them what happened and they believed it right away. So they were totally cool. Why do you think the guardsmen have been so, the, the, the guardsmen, not the commanders, have been so reluctant to come forward and talk about what actually happened? I think it's really clear, uh, you know, and even one of the officers I've talked to, Ron Snyder, when I first met him in his house nearby here, uh, I didn't know if he was going to shoot me or why. I, really, I was scared to go in there to tell you the truth. I didn't know what he was up to. I thought he maybe hated me. He was cool though. He's like an old grandpa guy. But uh, he said to us, he goes, we were, I go, what were you thinking, you know, in those days after the shooting? He goes, I'll tell you, he goes, the main thing we thought was, why is everybody making such a big fuss about this Kent State shooting incident? What's the big deal? He goes, we'd already gone into the black ghettos in Cleveland, Akron, Canton. We were shooting people all the time. Nobody ever made a fuss about it. He goes, so all of a sudden everybody's making a big fuss about these white kids getting shot. He goes, we were just perplexed. Since then, because they put out their cover up, students shot, students shot at them first, students throwing all these objects, you know, the Students uh, five feet away, all those have been destroyed by factual evidence, but they still have the burden on their shoulders of the national and international reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, they did this. So they're not going to admit they were the ones to blame. They still say what they said then. The students provoked the guard, the guard fired in self-defense. And they're sticking by that story. Now, some of the guard officers, uh, uh, have stuck with that, but the one or two of the officers and some of the enlisted men have expressed real regret. There was a documentary film called Kent State, The Day the War Came Home, from the year 2000, which you can buy online and you can also get it sometimes in the back of this really cruddy book for free. The DVD was great, but the book was just horrible. It was by Philip Caputo. I can't remember the title of this horrible book, but, but, the, but the DVD was fantastic. I'm in there, the guy interviewed me, some of the wounded students interviewed some of the mothers. The mothers are all gone now, the fathers are all gone. But some, I think three of the mothers are interviewed about their, their children. It was a great a documentary. They interviewed some guardsmen, and a couple of those enlisted men, those lower ranking guardsmen, not enlisted, they were you know, members of the National Guard that did the shooting. A couple of them were like very emotional, and they were admitting it was wrong. I think one or more of those guys is going to come forward between now and uh, it won't be the officers, though. You said that it wouldn't surprise you if something like this happened again? Yes. Because of like, all the parallels that we're seeing? Yep. What do you think that would look like in today's society? Well, I think there would be a tremendous reaction. Of course, they would try to cover it up again. They always try to blame the victims. You know, that, that, that's the phrase we've always used because it's just the perfect phrase to describe what happens. You get the Tiananmen shooting in China, you get the different incidents around the world. They always blame the hooligans, the rioters, the pro uh, in this country too, you know, the police shoot the black people all the time. Well, I just, we thought he had a gun, you know. He was doing something, he was reaching, you know. They always blame the victim. And that's what they would do. But I really think that the young people now, as then, and by the way, they tried that cover up then, but there was a national student strike in the days and weeks after the shootings here. There were four million students protesting, and you can see it out here in this uh, display about the reaction after the shooting. Called the National Student Strike of May 1970 for two or three weeks after. Four, four or five million students protesting. 800 colleges and universities shutting down. All the major universities in America shut down. It was a significant rebellion because the students saw through the lies, and the students raised hell. I think that would happen again. Uh, I really do. I mean, you know, you could just see what would happen because there's hatred in our society, there's division, there's polarization, citizen against citizen, which to me is just so scary now to me because of what happened back then. And you can learn the lessons of the dangers when you have citizens hating their fellow citizens. It's a dangerous situation. And I think that the young people, again, would act as we did, the conscience of America. 
sometimes the young people have to step forward and play that role because the older people have their own different agendas and they're not so free to raise their voices and come together to try to fight for change. But I think the younger generation would do it again. Um, you talked about stenciling design. Mm -hmm. uh, what role did posters and art kind of play in your all's campaign? It and played a good role. A second question to that, yeah. what, what role did the bigger schools like Berkeley and UCLA play in that too? Because I know they were vocal in art. Okay. First of all, about the art, uh, you know, back in the SDS, when I was here, Ken SDS was only here from September of 1968 until April of 69. So we're talking only about, what, eight months or something. Uh, just my luck, I came here, I moved into the dorm, I met Tom Grace, My turned out to be you know, my blood brother, I got shot, in, he got shot in the foot. I met him after I was only in my dorm room for five minutes, I heard the, cream, the band The Cream coming through the door, Eric Clapton. God, I went over there and knocked on the door. Hey, what's happening? My name's Al. I said, ah, come on in. But uh, we joined the SDS then. We joined the College Democrats. We joined the SDS. And in SDS, there were guys from the band Devo. You know, the band Devo, Whip It, and all that. Jerry Casale from Devo, who started Devo in 1975, I think. But in 1968, 69, he was in SDS, you know. Long-haired guy, pissed off about the war, and everything. but he was making the great posters. He was a great artist. Uh, there were other people around, uh, you know, some of the, the male students and the female students, making armbands, making posters, uh, the leaflets we would make, like I talked about, like you know, the press type and the stencils and all that, the mimeograph. They would have little little drawings on there and stuff, and they would make posters about the Vietnamese people that were killing and. Uh, they, they were, then they were part of the National SDS, and some of our artists were so good, they did some artwork for the National SDS, too. So the posters were always something. People would get creative. You can see those Alison Krauss over there in those images. Look at their, those posters. Some people would have a lot of fun with it, and it was a fun thing. It was an exciting, and there was the whole counterculture going on then. The hippie thing was going on, which was colorful. Uh, so that was really something. You know, they'd make protest badges. And, they would paint their faces up sometimes. Uh, there was a group called the Yippies. They believed in what they used to call revolution for the hell of it. They were just having fun, you know, smoking pot, free love, the whole thing. Those were the days. But uh, then getting over to the uh, second part of your question, Berkeley and places like that. I will say this, and I'm involved with, there's a Hollywood movie being planned. This is the fourth one, and I've had deals with every one of them. None of the other three films got made, but I have a life rights deal with these guys, so they interviewed me. They were surprised when I said this. You know, they go, well, you guys were at Kent State, and the world wasn't exactly a radical school. I said, yeah, you know what, we weren't exactly the most radical school. Berkeley was, Harvard, Columbia, University of Wisconsin at Madison, Oberlin College here, uh, Antioch College, different schools, you know, were some of the more radical ones, Berkeley and... Uh, San Francisco State and different places. And, uh, but we used to sit around, you know, when we were partying every night, and we'd be talking about the war, and we're mad, and all this stuff. But there was no more SDS that year, 6970, that was after SDS was gone. But we were in our apartment, and we're, yeah, we're anti-war. And we'd sit around, and we'd go, when the time comes, we're going to raise hell here in Kent. We're going to be, we used to say heavier. We're going to be heavier than Berkeley. We're going to be heavier than Madison, Wisconsin. And we were serious. <laughs> you might think I was like the Hollywood screenwriter and the director thought I was being ludicrous. But I said, no, we were serious. And we, we knew when the time came, we, we had a plan. And our goal was to be heavier than Berkeley and to inspire them. So, over here. So and we did it. We did it. So tomorrow we're going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to look at the Ooh, protest lucky. music oh, nice. um, exhibit. What role would you say protest music had? In protest music was huge. Uh, honestly, I've thought about this a lot. I get asked that question a lot. Uh, I really do think that without the music, there wouldn't have been the significant protest. I mean, the music was such a central part of our lives at the time and such a, an aspect that inspired us. Uh, in particular, going into 1970, into the spring, the Jefferson Airplane album, uh, Volunteers, had some songs on there. One was called We Can Be Together, and another one was called uh, uh, something about the revolution and all that. But let's see, We Can Be Together and uh, Volunteers of America. Those two songs were just 
such an inspiration to us. And we felt we couldn't ignore that inspiration and still be true to ourselves. We, that made us know we had to protest. Uh, Jimi Hendrix had an album that came out that, a few months before that. I think in January it was uh, recorded live at the Fillmore East on New Year's Eve going into the 1970s called The Band of Gypsies. He had a song on there, Machine Gun, talking about the soldiers getting killed in Vietnam, and picking up a gun and stuff. Uh, Jimi Hendrix really inspired us. There are Grateful Dead had some really good uh, anti-war songs, uh, Morning Dew and some other ones. So uh, that the music was so inspirational. It was just unbelievable. You know, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Street Fighting Man. Downtown got trashed Friday night. The windows are broken, and I'm not going to say any names here. But I mean, you know, we went down there. And we raised hell, and we made it back to our apartment right away, and we escaped the cops. And the first song we put on our, our stereo was Street Fighting Man by uh, the Rolling Stones. We were Street Fighting Man. And uh, so the music, I mean, uh, you cannot underestimate the role of the music and the culture. The counterculture, the whole hippie thing. You know, it was us against them. Us against the government. Our, our generation against the older generation. I, I think we, uh, we sh I'm still proud of what we did. Speaking of the culture, um, specifically like what you, uh, because hippies are notorious for like the long hair and the, right. and the kind of flowing clothing. Can you like describe like, what, why was that a fashion trend? And then like, what did that mean in terms of like your former protest, I guess? Well, you know, those fashion trends, they were mainly on the East Coast and the West Coast, to be honest. Uh, here at Kent, it's, a, it's a, an aspect I have to tell people. Some people think, well, you guys at Kent State by 1970, you guys were all hippies. You all had long hair. You were all listening to Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and all that protest music. The fact of the matter is, by 1970 here, I would say the counterculture, the hippie thing, the people that liked the radical underground music, we used to call it back then underground music, I'd say it was maybe 5% of the student body. 95% of the students here had short hair. They were in the frats and the sororities. And they were, you know, while, the, while we're out there protesting, there are tennis, kids, kids over there in the tennis courts playing tennis while we're out there getting shot. Uh, people sunbathing, you know. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like Kent State was, or even Berkeley, I'm sure, it was like a, a tiny minority uh, did that stuff. But it was, as far as the counterculture goes here too, like I came here in the fall of 68, I had a little bit of long hair, but I mean, I'm looking around and see, wow, there's all these, there were like maybe 5%, there were like a few hundred out of 21,000, there were a few hundred people had long hair. And I thought, man, those guys look cool. Those guys are, they're, they're standing up against the society. And all I had gone up to Detroit, I had a girlfriend in Dearborn, Michigan, and I met her up here in Geneva on the lake. Went up there and we went to a head shop there in Detroit. I bought a pair of bell bottoms. I was the first person in my hometown to wear bell bottoms. I mean, bell bottoms were a radical statement back then. You had the flares at the bottom. Most people just wore the regular pants, and uh, if you wore bell bottoms, you were kind of what we used to call a freak. Same thing with your long hair. You grew a beard or a mustache, or the girls grew their hair long, and the, the girls wore the like you said, the flowing clothing and the colorful clothes. And it became like your personal fashion statement that you were part of the anti-war people. You were part of the anti-establishment people. And when you'd walk around the Kent State campus in the fall of 68, going up to 1970, if you'd see somebody with long hair and wearing bell bottoms, you knew that you felt like a kinship. But it was a, we used to have our own little word. Somebody heard their sociology class, subculture. And that's what we called ourselves in our little apartment. We we're, we're a subculture. Because, but we were all tuned into each other because of the music and the styles and the anti-war attitude, and that really caused a minority to coalesce together. And it was a neat thing back then to be part of that. By 1971, all the frat guys had long hair and were on bell bottoms in 72, 73. My dad bought bell bottoms, you know, it just became like a common thing after like maybe 71, 72, 73. But back then, it was special. It was just a statement of your individuality and your attitude towards society. You were going to say something? Yeah. Um, do you think like the student protests were like helped shorten the war at all? Because I know absolutely, especially that national student strike after Kent State. By by uh, uh, all accounts, there's been a lot of people, a lot of historians, have, especially even back then, 1970, but thereafter have mentioned the Kent State incident as a significant, the significant turning point, and, and especially the national student strike that followed. 
And then there's always a question, well, was the national student strike that followed, five million, four million, five million students, was that because of the Kent State shooting or was it because of the invasion of Cambodia? Some conservative historians say, well, it was because Nixon invaded Cambodia and Kent State was just one little incident in there and the national student strike would have happened anyway. That's not true. Most historians, and there was a national survey done which included descriptions of all the hundreds of campuses that shut down. In the introduction to that big survey by the Urban Institute, they say the significant factor that triggered the national student strike was the shooting incident at Kent State University on May 4, 1970. So it, it, uh, it just really galvanized the young, it really, and different people have said, my roommate Tom Grace says in his book, Kent State was the spark. I mean, it really could have happened anywhere. If they'd done that in Berkeley or Chicago or something, it would probably, the, the country was ready for that. The young people were so fed up with that war. But it happened here. And, and it's now remembered as the significant turning point, not only against the war in Vietnam. And at my website, allencampfor.com, and our organization, the Kent May 4 Center, may4.org, we have a list there of the historical impact of Kent State 1970. Talking about the five million students, talking about the hundreds of universities shut down, talking about the impact on the Congress, the impact on Nixon. Nixon in his own memoir said those were the darkest days of his presidency. Nixon was pushed to the point of physical and emotional collapse. Uh, it had a tremendous effect on the uh, ending of the war, cutting off the funds, the Republicans in that November after May of 1970, the Republicans that were pro-war, suffered tremendous defeats. So the, the Congress shifted against the war. Public opinion for the first time during the Vietnam War, in May of 1970 after Kent State, for the first time public opinion shifted against the war. So it's just verified by numerous uh, statistics and uh, evidence. Well, did you guys learn anything here today? <laughs> We're going to be a quiz. <laughs> Thank you for your attention and your Thank questions. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.